Welcome. My name is Daniel. I'm a software engineer for Etsy. I'm working on the DevTools infrastructure team. You can find me as Mr. Taz all around the internet. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we approach scaling deployments at Etsy. So quick show of hands. Who knows what Etsy is? Wow, awesome. <laughs> so basically, in one sentence, Etsy is the marketplace we make together. We want to empower individuals to make a business and make a living from things they can actually handcraft and make themselves. And for some stats, we had around like 1.5 billion page views in February this year. We had around 4 million items sold, around 95 million of goods sold. We have around 22 million members and 800,000 active shops. And if you ever wondered what you can buy on Etsy, for example, if you ever wanted to have a backpack with awesome wings or you know, portal earrings, leather-bound journal, and of course, mustache stickers. Who doesn't love mustache stickers, right? Yeah. Um, you can basically find all of that on Etsy. Uh, some words about our technology stack. We are basically all LAMP, which means Linux, we're running CentOS. Um, Apache, we have a sharded MySQL backend which is basically master-master replication in the back end. Um, of course, we're running memcache. And you might have heard we're also running PHP. So that's basically our stack. We have some Python in there, some Ruby for uh, like infrastructure automation. We run Java and search stack and have still some post Postgres left over, which we try to get rid of. And But yeah, basically, the main Etsy.com app is one monolithic PHP app. So that's really interesting about deployment. We don't have like a service-oriented architecture. We don't run, with some exceptions, like the search stack, for example, as I mentioned, is Java, so that's a service in our infrastructure. And Photos Upload is also a different service. But for all intents and purposes, Etsy.com is one monolithic app which we deploy as one. Also, all the code we have is stored in Git, but we don't do branching. So we always ship trunk. We always ship the master branch. It's supposed to always be clean, buildable. We're no, we don't use any branching for features. All of the features that we use are in master and flagged off. So we can turn them on when we decide they are ready to launch. And as you can imagine, it's kind of like a busy day on like your daily master branch on SEO.com. Uh, but still, we managed to deploy around like 20 to 40 times a day. As you can start with it. <laughs> so this includes um, the web stack deploy and also the config deploy. As I said before, we don't do branching in, um, in the SEM. We basically do branching code. So whenever we want to flag on something and turn on um, a new feature for a subset of users. That's what basically happens in a config push. And um, all the rest is basically a web push. In a normal week, we have around 150 people committing changes to FC.com and deploying them by themselves. So there's no like release engineering team. There's no like, hey, ops guys, here's my code, run it. It's just like you as a developer, as soon as you are comfortable deploying your code to the live infrastructure, you push a button and it goes out. So how does that work? On your for first day at Etsy, you're all excited about starting your thing. You want to change things. You know you can write awesome code. You want to uh, do awesome stuff. And that's what we let you do. Your very first project when you started at Etsy is deploy Etsy.com. There is no fill out paperwork, there's no, here's your HR form, go and <laughs> fill out stuff. Oop. Sorry about that. <coughs> okay, as I said, your first project is deployfc.com. When you start, that's your first task you get, you sit down and you're supposed to take a photo. We have a very nice photo booth where you can just sit down and you know, take a funny picture of you with like whatever fits. 
<coughs> and you deploy your picture to the Teams page. <coughs> so the whole company is an IRC. When you start, you usually have your coworkers tell you what are your basic rooms you should hang out in, what's the team room and all that, and then you start talking to people about, okay, where do I find this code, where, how do I do this? The, the whole company is on IRC. If you have HR questions, you go into the HR ISD room. If you want to talk about pizza, you go into the, the main room and ask people what's your favorite Brooklyn pizza. Um, and there's also a deploy channel. So right from the start, you can actually watch people deploy while you're preparing your first deploy. And of course, it's always a good idea to paste you know, an animated GIF or something to get to know your coworkers and find out if they love cat pictures as much as you do. Um, <clears throat> we're running a GitHub Enterprise instance, and all of our code is in there. So that's really helpful, because a lot of the people who started are actually already familiar with GitHub, and they know how to do pull requests, they know how to use the interface, and that makes a very low barrier of entry for actually um, doing changes on the code, getting familiar with the setup, and working on the Etsy code. <coughs> also, everyone who starts gets their own VM. So basically, it's um, a KVM VM that has a slimmed down dev version of the whole Etsy stack, Shaft, onto it. We run Chef for all of our infrastructure automation, so it's basically just the cookbooks we run in production. We also run on the developer VM. And when I say slim down, it's not like, yeah, it's kind of running the same PHP version and there's also some patchy on there. It's really like, we run memcache, MySQL, the sharding setup we use in production is running on the developer VM to give you the most similar setup in your dev environment that you will see in production to not have surprises like, oh, that worked totally fine in my VM, but in production it breaks. Um, for that, we have a nice front end where you can also create your own VM. If you have like a smaller side project and you want to just host it somewhere to like test out if that works for you, you can create your own VM. Um, we bas it basically comes in three sizes. So we had to start with, we had like the regular normal developer VM, which is um, five gigs of RAM. It's one CPU on the host and 40 gigs of disk. But you can also choose to just have a mini me VM, which is like a smaller version if you just want to run a different version of a WordPress blog to test stuff out or something like that. And we also added the possibility to run the search stack on a VM. So if you want to um, develop on the search stack and need a little more beefier VM, you can get the double size VM under the code name Cartman. And at that, it can, you can run the full Java stack on there. So you're all set up. You have IRC, you're logged in, you've pasted your first animated GIF, you've uploaded your keys to GitHub, you've uh, familiar yourself with your VM, so it's time to write some code. As I said, um, all of Etsy.com basically is written in PHP, and a lot of people start with, oh, PHP, that's awesome, because everybody loves PHP. And it's actually true. <laughs> um, so as I said, your first task is to add yourself to the team about page, and that's what you're doing. When you're done and you feel like, OK, I kind of know HTML, and it's all looking great, you can send the review to one of your new coworkers. Um, for that, we have a tool which is also shafted out to all the dev VMs, and you just run review with the recipient name. And that person gets assigned a review, which is basically a pull request. And it's automatically assigned to that person, so you can see what reviews you are assigned to and what you have to look over. And as you can see here, we also use that for changes in Chef. So whenever you do changes on your infrastructure, you send the review and have someone say, OK, that, this looks good to me. Send it out. <coughs> it's also, as I said, really helpful since a lot of people working on open source already know how github.com works and know how to use pull requests. So it's not a big change to like learn the new 
um, div tool to learn a new review tool. You're basically, you can basically use what you're already used to. And if you've sent out your review and someone has said, okay, that's awesome, looks good. Uh, I can't see anything wrong. You wanna try if your changes actually run on the CI cluster and don't break the build. And as you might know, a wise man once said, try, uh, do or do not, there is no try. But as it turns out, there actually is. So try <laughs> is our, um, basically is an instance of our CI setup, which lets you um, run your patches against trunk or master. So whenever you run, the, the command is actually also called try on your VM. So you go to your repository, you actually run try, and it diffs your current state against that of origin master, sends the patch up to Jenkins, patches the source tree, and runs all of our test suite against that. So that's a very convenient and easy way to let you know if the changes you did are actually working before you start deploying and break CI while you're deploying stuff and are totally frustrated because you missed a semicolon or something. So, <clears throat> yeah, so that's the first step um, of actually finding out if your code works. So how does CI work at FC? In the old days we had this really awesome CI setup which were around like 10 build tests. They had all nice transformers nicknames so you could run your tests on Ratchet and feel totally awesome about it. And we, we ran a lot of Jenkins executors on that particular build host and ran into some problems with that. It turns out that for one, Jenkins is really good at handling different and a lot of connections to one executor, but not running multiple executors on a single instance. And also we had like our DB unit tests, for example, had a lot of I.O. So whenever a DB unit test ran, we basically packed the whole disk. We had an SSD in there, but still it like basically packed the whole disk and every like every other job that needed to run on that host basically had to wait for DB unit to load all the fixtures and like be done with all the I.O. So that obviously didn't scale for us, and as we brought on more people, we had this problem that more people were trying to run I.O. intensive tasks, and basically you had to wait a longer time for actually a try to finish, which was totally unacceptable. So we needed a new builder, and you all know who the best builder is, right? So our new system is basically called the Bobs, which are our build hosts. They still run on basically the same build tests, <coughs> but they are LXC containers on that host. And we bought some more SSDs and actually put three SSDs in every build host and handed out labels to all instances. So right now we have any labeled bobs and heavy labeled bobs. And the heavy labeled ones are all only running the I.O. intensive jobs and there can only ever be one heavy bob on one disk. So whenever you run um, an I.O. heavy job, it's actually bound to that one disk, and you're not like trying to run two DB unit um, jobs on the same disk and totally peg it. And yeah. So the current setup, we have three disks which are made up of um, five, five, and four bobs. The last disk only has four because it's also running the operating system for the build host. And we have around 200 bobs, which are mostly for try. So our like, actual CI instance only runs a handful of bobs because we only use it while we're actually deploying. But the try instance, which is just um, basically the same Jenkins instance as the CI with a little different setup to accept your patches runs a lot more of the tests, because right now I think we have around 130 engineers, something like that. Whoa. And <clears throat> yeah, and they all basically run the tests on try. Okay, so now you've written your code, you've had it review, you ran it on try, try said, yeah, that's fine, it's all successful. 
um, your next step is to actually hop on the push train, which is our notion of how we deploy code to production. And the push train, in reality, looks a little bit different, not nice blue. But it's actually a channel on IRC, which shouldn't be a surprise, since everything basically happens on IRC. Deployment also happens on IRC. So the push channel is just one channel where everybody hangs out. And as soon as you're ready to deploy code, you add yourself to the topic and say, OK, I'm ready to deploy. I want to um, get my code out. <clears throat> um, a train can have up to eight members, and the first one in the train is what's called a driver. That's the person who's actually pushing the button to say, please go live now. And we actually have opening hours on push, which is more or less because most of the engineering team is centered around uh, Brooklyn. So we have some people in the UK, we have some people in California, but 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. New York City time basically is like the main time while people are active and want to deploy. So whenever you want to deploy something outside of that time frame, you actually have to make sure that there are enough people around, let one of the tech leads know that you're going to um, push an important change. Because the thing is, you have, let's say, you don't start at 7, but you start at 10 and work until late, you still have like 11 hours a day where you can actually push code. So there is no like need to actually push code late at night while everybody's sleeping. And if it breaks something, you're waking people up. That's not really something you want to do if you know you can just deploy it whenever, you, like after breakfast, for example. So that's basically why we have opening times. And a normal topic in a push channel looks something like this. So you can see in the first push, they're already on production. Uh, Kyle, who's the driver in the first push, already marked himself with a star, which means all those changes are good, and it behaves like he's expected it to be. And then there's a single push train where only Jay Paul is pushing, and Daniel was actually pushing a config push at that point. As you, um, <clears throat> that scheme of how we deploy was basically developed when we had around, I think, like 20 or 30 engineers. And as you can maybe imagine, with more engineers, it gets way more complicated in the topic. And if you, like, every time have to copy out the topic, add yourself to the end, or add a star after your name, you run into interesting changes where people override each other's topics, and somehow nobody knows anymore who wants to deploy. So this is why we created PushBot. Pushbot is basically an IRC bot which just takes commands and handles the topic for you. So whenever you're ready to deploy, you just type .join, and it adds you to the end of the, uh, of the newest push train. If there isn't one, or if like, the newest already has eight members, it just creates a new one and puts you in as the driver. Um, then the next step is basically pushing your changes up to GitHub. Whenever that's done, you just say dot .in, which means, yeah, my changes are there. We all can push. And on every stage where you actually have to test your changes, just tell pushbot.good if you are OK with the changes to let everybody know it's all good. And then do dot .done in the end. It's basically a nice way of not having to like override each other's topic every time. But Pushbot also has some other nice little features, like when you're done with the push, it actually links you to the deploy dashboard to show you all the graphs you're supposed to look at after deploy. And if you've forgotten that it's already after 10 PM because you were like, totally hatched on into coding, Pushbot also tells you, well, it's kind of late. Do you really want to push now? Because there might not be a lot of people around. And Pushbot in itself is basically a Java application. All of the commands it takes are um, coded into an Ansible grammar. So if you feel like extending it and are totally awesome in Ansible, uh, feel free to check it out in GitHub. <clears throat> Next step is how does the deploy actually look like for the driver? So as I said, the driver is the first person in every push, uh, in every push train, and actually um, pushes the button to bring code to production. 
For that, we have a tool called DeployNator, which surprisingly enough deploys our code. And it's basically um, has two buttons. The first button, when you click that, all of your changes go to staging, which we call princess. So that's why the first button is called save the princess with tests, because when you kick that off, you deploy all your changes to staging, but also kick off your Jenkins jobs to actually run all of the unit tests, all the integration tests, the smoker tests against staging, and all that. It has a nice um, interface to actually tell you how the push topic looks right now, who's um, in push with you, and who's currently in which stage on push. Um, whenever you click that button, it uh, streams by all of the deployment logs. So all of the deployments is basically based on D shell, the distributed shell, and rsync. That's like the core of our deployment. So whatever we do on deployment, you see streaming by and can like, if you know the deploy very well, which you will do, like, let's say you've deployed, let's say, 15 times. So it's basically probably your second day. And you will probably notice some differences in the run log if there's something up. But actually, you don't have to, because there is like an error log uh, window at the top, which shows you everything that gets written to a standard error on a deploy and things we catch inside the app, which we find interesting or sh looks like an error. As I said, um, while we have like a growing team and more than 30 people actually deploying, this can happen that you um, feel like you want to deploy code and it's late at night and you push it up to GitHub and then so, oh, it's already late. Well, I'm going to do it first thing tomorrow morning. Nobody's going to like deploy before that because I'm an early riser. Um, <clears throat> that actually caused some problems for us because when there is actually someone getting up earlier as you and wants to push, it could be that he or she is pushing out your changes and doesn't know about it because you maybe have missed it in the diff link or you didn't pay attention to what the actual changes are, and then you're surprised that you suddenly pushed out a change you didn't expect. So that's why Deployinator will also tell you when there are commits in GitHub which are older than six hours and are not deployed yet, so that you get this like nice notice about, hey, someone pushed up to GitHub, but it's not deployed, so maybe take a second look and be sure you actually want to deploy that. <clears throat> Since a lot of the build steps and the diff links and a lot of the UI are um, based on getting the version that is currently running on production and diffing it against the version you pushed up to GitHub, DeployNator will gray out the buttons for you and tell you, well, I can't really get the version from production or staging. There might be something wrong, and I'm going to create the buttons right now, because if we don't have the versions, I'm not sure we actually want to deploy. Now, this is really helpful if you're not like um, an experienced deployer and don't like are a little bit scared now because the buttons are grayed out or like the diff links look different. But there are legitimate reasons why you would actually want to push why you can't get versions. Say your production cluster is down and you actually want to push a fix, but deploying is telling you, well production is down, you shouldn't deploy. So that's like an interesting conundrum there. So that's why you have a click link to actually override that version check, which just gives you the message that you decided to override the version check, and Jenkins might not work, the diff links might not work, dragons could appear and eat your lunch or something, so maybe be really careful about this deploy right now, but you can go ahead. And in really serious conditions where you see like, oh, someone pushed something up to GitHub which is really bad by accident, you can also lock down all pushes. So everybody will get a grayed out button, which you can't override. And you will have to manually say, OK, please remove this lock, because I'm sure I really want to deploy this. And if you're interested in how the inner workings of our deployment system work, it's also up on GitHub. <clears throat> Take a look. It's basically a Sinatra app that runs a lot of shell scripts in the back end. It's a really nice way, and we deploy very many different internal apps with that. We deploy our main stack with that. Um, <clears throat> so take a look if you're interested. So 
when you're done with your deploy, I showed before, Pushbot is telling you um, your code is live. You should watch graphs here. And that's basically how it looks like. So we have this deployment dashboard, which gives you basically the most important metrics about the business. So you see three on sweaters. If you've ever seen the four, four page on Etsy, it's basically this person who has accidentally knitted a three on sweater, and it's holding it up and saying, oh my god, something went wrong. And that's basically what the three on sweater graph is on there. Um, we, get, we graph all of our like, HTTP status codes we actually return. We have graphs about our current CDN balance, who's serving what, and how much traffic is going to Edgecast or Akamai or Fastly. And we also have this notion of deploy lines. So whenever an actual deploy happens, we just send basically a one to Graphite. And if you know Graphite, there's this like draw as infinite function, with, which just like draws a line on your graphs. And that's what we use as deploy lines. So whenever you look at a graph and you see um, a blue line, that's basically a web deploy. And if you see a red line, that's a config deploy. We also deploy, uh, we also mark deploy lines for chef changes. So if you see like a black line in your graph, that means somebody pushed out a chef change. And if you see a spike, that could be related to a change in infrastructure and not a change in your code. And we also have deploy lines to indicate when actual schema changes are going on and all that. So you definitely know when there are changes in basically any part of the infrastructure and that your chain, your spikes you see in the graphs are not actually related to your code change. And <clears throat> as you maybe can guess, the dashboard is up on GitHub. So take a look if you're interested in how we do dashboards and how we um, graph all our changes. Another really nice tool, which is really helpful after the deploy, is what we call SuperGrab. SuperGrab is basically um, a web front end for tail dash f pipe grab something. So it streams by all of our logs from the HTTP error logs, from the staging error logs. We have a client logger which basically logs everything um, that goes wrong in the front end. And you can see here, it also logs all of the Gearman error logs. So all of the background processing is basically run on Gearman jobs. And all of the, those <clears throat> stream by in SuperGrab also. Um, yeah. And surprise, surprise, it's also up in GitHub. So check it out if you want to run a Node.js based tail um, dash f pipe grab. As I um, said, we have a lot of tooling. We have a lot of like different tools around deployment. We have SuperGrab, the dashboards, Graphite is running. There is an abundance of tools you can use to actually make sure the changes um, you <clears throat> just push to production are looking good. But what do you do when you don't know if what you're seeing on the dashboard, for example, is OK or if you broke something? So we have also have an internal status site, which basically shows you, OK, um, you can actually trust CI it's not down or doing anything weird. Graphite is working, StatC is working, SuperGrab is working. So as we grew in um, engineers, there was also this problem that whenever try, for example, was slow, we had 20 people tell us that try is slow. And we didn't really have a way to say, yeah, we know we are just working on that. So that's why we created the basically internal status site, which does the same thing as our external Etsy.com status site, just for our internal tools. <clears throat> so as a summary, our current setup, which started out with like around 20 engineers, has right now scaled to around 150 committers which are committing code every week to Etsy.com and are constantly deploying the main site. Um, we're constantly trying to improve the speed of deployment. So right now, our normal deploy takes around, um, I'd say, 15 minutes. So <clears throat> um, that means that we can deploy around four times an hour, which 
in, let's say, a normal working day of 10 hours means you can only deploy 40 times a day. So that's why we are also trying to make sure that our like, individual deploy steps are um, quick and trying to make them quicker so we can have more deploys. But we're also trying to find weak parts in the process. So f while going from a kind of small amount of engineers to like a bigger amount of engineers actually deploying each day, we find weaknesses in our workflow where people just know how things happen, but new people that come on board don't necessarily know um, how that works. So we try to find those weak parts in the processes, make them robuster, make them faster, turn them into tools you can actually use on your VM. You can, um, we can set up as a web front end or something like that. A big part in all of that is bringing dev much, much closer to production. So if you want to be sure that what you actually developed on your VM runs on production and can deploy it really quickly, you have to have um, your development environment be really close to your production environment. So that's one of the strong efforts we're trying um, to get to. And lastly, not being able to deploy is also a priority one bug at FC. So basically, not being able to deploy has the same severity as FC.com being down. Everybody who's concerned with how deployment works uh, drops everything, jumps into the push channel, tries to figure out why deployments don't work, and basically tries to fix them. So that's a big um, driver behind making deploys faster. It's not something that we have to do because we need to get our code out. Because deployment is a really central thing everybody cares about. And everybody is concerned with trying to make it work, trying to make it scale, and trying to make it better for everybody so that we can deploy more than 40 times a day. Um, if you want to know more about uh, some of the tools. We usually blog about everything we open source. So codescraft.ft.com uh, is our engineering blog. We have a lot of um, blog posts about there. Basically, all of the tools I introduced are explained there in detail. We collect all the talks we give on ft.com codescraft talks. There is a GitHub site. And of course, if you feel like this is awesome and you want to deploy all day long, we also are hiring. So I think I actually uh, was a little bit faster than I thought. So we have a lot of time for questions if you want to know anything. If you don't can think of anything you want to ask now, find me later, and I'm happy to explain anything to you. And I have a mic. Hang on. Hello. Um, sorry. The the test that the CI run, is it only unit tests or is the functional regression integration test being done also? Like uh, Selenium and SAE, stuff like that. Sorry, can you say again? Um, the test that the CI run, yeah. the trial, does that include um, Selenium, SAE type test, functional test? Um, yes. So the functional tests are, so we're using BHAT for functional tests um, against production and staging smokers. And we run Selenium tests, but not on deploy. We run them periodically because they're um, kind of, I think we're actually running them on Sauce Labs, as far as I know. So we're, running, we're not running them on deploy, but we are running Selenium tests. Hi. Um, from my experience of Splunk, uh, it seems fairly similar to the super grep that you guys have made uh, because it can tell logs and you can search and all that sort of stuff. So what are the main differences between the two uh, when you guys use it? So um, super grep is basically your real-time log streamer. So super grep shows you what's going on right now in your infrastructure. A co really common um, pattern is that you go into super grep and you see an error. And then you go to Splunk to actually see the historical data about, has that occurred in the last two weeks? Did that just happen? Did it just start or something? So 
we use Splunk for basically all of our historical searches and like basically getting to know what was in your log files three weeks ago. And SuperGrab, basically for what is going on right now, did I break anything in my current code deploy? Um, do you guys uh, prefer to roll back or roll no. forward when you do breaking changes? There's no such thing as a rollback. <laughs> it's like, never go back. But when you <laughs> when you see that you broke something, what you can do is revert your commits and then push them back up. But you also, it's basically like a new deploy. You don't, because you have so many moving parts in the infrastructure, you can never be sure that if you change that, that you actually at that stage you were before the deploy. So we revert git changes when we see something broke, but it's basically a new deploy. Um, you have a code review uh, part of your process, um, I'm also, which is it's nice for knowing if your code's right, but uh, I'm wondering how your developers know what to build, like where do they getting their requirements from, and if that also fits into, into the process somewhere, and where that's reviewed so that that code that's actually being deployed in the first place is meeting some sort of requirement. Um, I mean basically, if our code reviews, uh, code reviews are somehow tagged to the requirements for features, is that what you're asking? Y yes, where those features coming in, uh, or the feature requests. Um, so basically, so we, we run Jira for all of our like, bug tracking and project planning. And what we do is we link commits to Jira. So when you see commits in a review, you can see the link to Jira and see what feature it concerns. But um, in the, so at least in the like core infrastructure team where I'm working, we're not actually tying that really tightly to any feature like requirement planning. We just basically send out a review about this code is supposed to do this related to this ticket. If you guys think that looks okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Hi. You say you're moving away from Postgres into MySQL. Yeah. Can yeah. you give us a bit of background on that? Yeah, sure. So, um, actually, basically, started out as, um, from an architectural point of view, we had this huge Postgres instance which ran a lot of like stored procedures. And then we had like a basically stored procedure routing middleware which routed um, requests from the front end in through the router into the Postgres instance. And this was really problematic. We had this like single point of failure in the middle. And the only way we could actually scale the Postgres instance with our setup was uh, basically vertically scaling it up. And whenever the database was down, like our one database was down, the site was down. And at some point around, I think now, three years ago, um, a lot changed in the in engineering um, structure. A lot of new people were brought up. And it was basically, one point was because the um, new operations and engineering team was very familiar with MySQL. Because um, they basically, a lot of them came from Flickr, which are also running MySQL. And the decision was to switch from like a single database backend to master-master replication pairs. And at that point, people, were more, uh, people in engineering were more familiar with MySQL. And as far as I've heard, MySQL replication worked much better than Postgres replication at that point. So the decision was made to actually shard out all our data across master-master replication pairs. Hi. Um, you're deploying a large monolithic PHP app multiple times a day. How yeah. do you prevent that from impacting your customers? Do you load balancing? What does that look like? Um, load balance what? Um, so if, when you're deploying to a server that is um, taking traffic, yeah. do, you, do you stop it from taking traffic? Do you wait until it's sort of quietened down and deploy it? How do you prevent those many, many daily deployments from hurting your users, from them getting uh, different versions of the site, getting different uh, 
assets, that sort of thing. Oh, okay. Um, so we don't so we we don't restart service uh, when we deploy, basically. So whenever a server gets a new code, um, I think we gracefully the Apache, but we don't actually like restart all of the web servers at once. And we also have so if you know distributed shell, it has like this fan out factor. So you can say you want to um, run this command at 30 boxes or something like that. And I think our current fan out is around 30 boxes, which actually get the code, um, rsync it over, then have a local rsync to actually, so when the code uh, lands in the, doc, in the document root, it's actually only a local rsync to make it faster, and basically then has new code. So we're not atomic uh, in terms of deploys across our web cluster, and we're trying to get to atomic deploys on a request level right now, but we don't like we don't shut down servers to have them like get new deploys or shut down HTTP on them. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay, I've got a few questions um, relating to security. Okay. Um, what's your approach to competition? Do you, do you worry much about competition? Sort of, do you have any secret sauce that you want to protect? I was just thinking with like 150 developers and new people coming all the time, how do you protect your intellectual property? Do you feel that you have stuff that you need to protect? That kind of stuff. Um, I mean, sure, we have stuff we need to protect, but that's more about like user data and all that. We're really open about how things work and how we try to make things work, and really interested in like showing them, showing that to you, and getting feedback about it and what like other people think about how we do stuff. So we have this actually we have this engineer um, this engineering exchange program where we actually send one engineer for a week to a different company. We did that with Twitter, for example. We had one of Twitter employees uh, working for us um, for a week. And on her first day, she deployed Etsy.com. There's no, like, you can't deploy Etsy.com because you're not, like, a proper Etsy employee or something. So there's nothing, like, super secret. I mean, we don't put our database schemas on a public GitHub or something, but there's no like, there's no like secrecy in how stuff works. We don't keep that a secret. Like, if you come, it's very possible that you come in. Like, board members, for example, deploy Etsy.com. We have dogs deploying Etsy.com. <laughs> it's not like <laughs> deployment is something super secret, special thing we do, and nobody is supposed to know about it. Does it make sense? Sorry, me again. Um, do you use um, feature flags? Yeah. Like, or and would you deploy to only one box and access that one server to see whether the, the code just took up is working or not? So it's, is it just feature flags or everything? Yeah. So everything, like everything rollout and ramp up related, is only feature flags. Our feature flag API is um, also on GitHub, by the way. So if you want to check it out, it's. Um, we don't do like host-based rollout of code changes or something like that. All, all web fronts get the same code all the time. And everything that's based on whether it should be <clears throat> only enabled for Etsy employees or for a subset of users, that's all in the uh, feature framework. And I think that's it. I'm going to get a minion to do this from now on. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Daniel. Okay. Thanks. Um,